Welcome, everybody. Today, we are interviewing the creators of Cobra Kai, John Hurwitz and Hayden Schlossberg. Thanks so much for doing this interview, guys. I'm very excited to talk with you. So I've read and watched many interviews with you guys, and I know you've been massive fans of The Karate Kid. So can you briefly explain your experience with The Karate Kid and the first time you saw it and how it affected your life, um, obviously excluding making Cobra Kai? I mean, for me, it was you know starting... You know, I saw it in the theater. It was one of the first movies I ever saw in the movie theater. And I'll never forget the the moment when you realize that, you know, everything Mr. Miyagi has Daniel doing is actually teaching him karate. It was sort of yeah. the first time I remember there being sort of like this big, you know, trick or twist in a movie that I that, you know, sort of blew my mind. And, you know, whether it's connecting to the underdog story, you know, as a as a young person. Uh, that was something that, you know, emotionally, you know, you all connect to and that, that triumph over the bully, uh, was a big thing early on, but really uh, as we, uh, you know, that's what I, what's so wonderful about the Karate Kid as a movie is that at every age in your life, you could connect with something else, whether it's, you know, you're an adult now, like, you know, we are in our forties and looking from more like the, you know, the mentorly. Uh, side of things, really connecting with Mr. Miyagi and sort of his journey and and that kind of thing. That's something that more in our adult lives, when we were teenagers and, you know, just big fans of comedy, uh, you know, we were obsessed with the Cobra Kais. We were obsessed with like, there's this teenage karate gang and they, they were the villains, you know, typically in a lot of 80s movies, it was like, okay, the football team, they were the bad guys. But what was so unique about this uh, particular movie was there's this, you know, gang of teenagers in this high school where karate is the big deal. And, yeah. they, you know, they ride around on these bikes and they have leather jackets. <laughs> and the whole thing is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And as fans of Billy Zabka, uh, you know, in, in, you know, when we were teenagers, Hayden and I have been friends since we were in high school and we met Josh in, in college. Um, you know, in, in that, that time frame, we were just obsessed with like, you know, Billy Zabka as this guy who played, you know, a jerk in a bunch of movies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know, all, you see all of the, the these uh, ways that the film impacted us are, are you find all of it in Cobra Kai in one way or another. Right. Um, do you have a favorite movie? Do you have a favorite Karate Kid movie? I mean, Hayden, what do you think? What's your favorite? Mine's the first one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I the the first one is the one I fell in love with. You know, John saw it in the theater. I didn't see it in the theater. I had a cousin who had uh, it, you know, on, on a VHS. And yeah. so it was a movie that I saw a bunch of times because I had it on VHS and, you know, fell in love with the under, underdog story like John did. Um, so that that was like the first impression with the world. And, and it, it is, I think the best one. Um, but I think that the second one is very worthy and was really good and had the connective tissue that you want to see in a franchise, you know, that really cared about what came before it. And that's because Robert Mark Kamen had written all three movies. Um, mm -hmm. So even the third movie, which I think, you know, rightfully has a lot of criticisms about it. It felt like there was connective tissue there. You had Bill Conti doing the music. You had Avildsen directing. You had uh, Mr. Miyagi and Daniel exiting the airport from Okinawa. You have right. at least, even though it's you know uh, a disservice to the character, you at least have an acknowledgement of what happened to Kumiko. So it really felt like you're watching the story of Daniel's life. Um, and I, so, as a kid and not a film, you know, uh, or film critic, not that I'm a film right. critic now, but uh, as just a kid watching the movies, I just was like, oh, I, I got excited every time there was a Karate Kid movie. And so I, I love them all, but the first one was the one that, you know, that I think sets up the themes of what this franchise is all about. Yeah, I never had a problem with the third one. In fact, it was one of my favorites, uh, shamefully i could say but uh mainly because of terry silver and i like how you guys added so much of the extra backstory on it i was hopped up on cocaine it was the 80s and explained a lot of how he uh a lot of the criticism which was cool kind of shuts people up um by the way it, i don't know why it made me black and white should i change it or <laughs> <laughs> you can I change it aesthetic choice right okay, give me you know it, it like malfunction i'll just refresh there you are in my opinion you guys do the best job at uh continuing an already established franchise the best i've ever seen 
And you stay true to the characters. You are always my go-to example of how to properly refresh an older franchise, you know, whether I'm talking about Star Wars or whatever. Um, what's something that you find really essential to the story writing process when revisiting these characters that have been idolized and cemented in our minds for decades? You know, how, how do you come up with the backstories? How do you know exactly where to go with them? And uh, what's your process like? Hayden, do you want to go first? You know, our, our process was we have to serve two audiences, you know, in general. The, the first audience is the audience that made this franchise a success to begin with. Why, why are we here? Why are we doing this? You know, if right. we're, the reason we were doing Cobra Kai um, is because we love the Karate Kid and we thought that this would work. If you've seen the Karate Kid, you're going to have a natural interest in seeing this. And we want to deliver on that promise to that audience. But what made the, if it's just all callbacks, if it's just all, hey, remember this, you know, then it's not, it really is not as good as what it originally was. You know, you have to find its essence of, of storytelling for today. And, you know, to that end, you know, you could create, you know, we created the younger characters that are going through what the characters in Karate Kid went through um, with some maybe more modern forms of bullying, but it's like, you know, it's kind of a different but same sort of world for teenagers today. And, you know, we have our older characters that, you know, are, we're not, are not just there to serve the younger characters, like they have their own stories that we're invested in. And so I think it's just like, we, we really, uh, we try to serve the hardest core fans that really know, that will appreciate like the most minute kind of callback or line. But also we have to forget about all of that and start from square one and think about people who don't give a damn about that original movie. Why do they care about this now? And, you know, if you, and, you know, you'll, we've seen now a bunch of different fans of Cobra Kai that really didn't know the Karate Kid that well, maybe heard of it, but it wasn't mm -hmm. anything that that was important to them. But you watch it and you become invested in it because we made Johnny an archetypal person for today and Miguel an archetypal person for today. And it all works story-wise and doesn't rely on your knowledge, but if you do have that knowledge, it's like this double whammy of awesomeness because you're getting all that nostalgia. You're getting all the memories and all those feelings, but you're engrossed in a current story. And that right. that's it's it's finding that balance. That's the trickiest thing, I think. Right. Yeah. I think one thing I just add is it's fun for us that like, you know, the show is different things for different people is one of the things that we really enjoy about it. It's, yeah. you know, for, you know, a certain segment of the population, it's, you know, there's something comedic about like our main character is Johnny Lawrence, who we who we all collectively <laughs> hated for so many years, yeah. you know, despite the defenders, you know, at, when when at least when I was a kid and I watched uh, the Karate Kid, I was scared of that guy and yeah. hated him for what he did to Daniel. Um, yeah. So, you know, there is this, you know, comedic element behind the whole show it's like you know when when we were nominated for an emmy people were like well comedy category is it comedy is it drama you know the truth of the matter is it's a comedy inherently to me because of what we're doing like we're but, taking but it, it, it's it's played as a drama but that yeah. that's like playing point. it as a drama like like as you were talking john i was thinking in episode the in season four episode one there's a scene i think a lot of karate kid fans find funny which is when Terry Silver says, you know, he's calling back on the past and he's like, you know, I, I was terrorizing a teenager at a high school karate tournament. Like, you know, it sounds insane just talking about it. But if you haven't seen the karate kid and you're just watching this, it it it, it kind of we're playing it very real. And so that so that's an example of playing to two different audiences. Like we could yeah. make it a little bit more winky there, and yeah. it would take away from the reality of the story today. Um, but again, if you know Karate Kid, you're like, yeah, like that is kind of the weirdest shit in the, in that movie. <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly, but that's exactly what I was getting at. Like it, it's, you know, throughout the entire series, that's the balancing act that we're doing where it's, it's a drama throughout, like you're emotionally invested in these characters from beginning to end. But if you know what we know as fans of Karate Kid, there's something hilarious going on oftentimes within the drama, even in the, some of the darkest moments, sometimes it's 
also kind of hilarious. So right. like it's th like that's what that's what we love about making the show. You know, it's I've skewed a little bit away from your initial question, which was, you know, how do you do something? Um, you know, bring back something in while honoring the past and and doing you know you know the modern version. And I think it it really is that it, it's like we we care a lot about the past. We right. you know we, the reason why you love Miguel is because you're meeting him individually, but you're meeting him in how he relates to Johnny. You care more about Samantha and you care more about, uh, you know, uh, Robbie because of their relationships with the legacy characters. So it's finding that the, uh, you know, making you emotionally invested in the new characters in a way that isn't off-putting to the people who love the original characters. And then once you're emotionally invested in those characters, you can be on their, their own journeys. And, yes. you know, and that's really it. Yeah. Perfect answer. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking you guys did. One thing I want to know is, and I don't know how you do this, but it, it's like each, so season one, I feel like really focused a lot on Johnny. And, you know, you had the the younger, the new cast came in and you focused on them too. But each season that goes on, it's like you focus more and more on all of the new characters that you keep bringing in. How do you find that balance? Because you do it so well where it's it doesn't feel like, okay, we're focusing too much on the new guys. We're focusing too much on the old guys. How do you do this? Because it just, it it blends, it, everything bleeds together in the end so well. Well, every episode when we're in the writer's room, you, you, are thinking about Johnny and Daniel. Like you make sure that in each episode, you're like, what's going on with Johnny in the episode? What's going on with Daniel in the episode? So that you're not losing sight of the, those initial characters that you came to see. The way we've developed the story, most of the other characters intertwine with Johnny and Daniel in one way or another, and their stories are going to sort of blend together. Um, you know, it is a challenge because we have so many characters at this point that you don't want to lose sight of them for long stretches of time. Uh, but then you, you know, sometimes accept, okay, this character who, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of the newer characters who you like, you know, they may stand down for a few episodes in a way that like they're not showing up. There have been times in the series where Robbie is not there for a couple episodes or even Miguel's not in an episode or Sam's not in an episode, like that kind of a thing. Um, but as long as we're feeling like their pre their presence in the overall story, mm -hmm. um, it works. But I think when it comes down to it, it's you know we 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 don't just sort of like write the first episode and we're like okay now we're done with that let's move on to the second episode. Mm -hmm. It's we have all ten episodes of the season up on the wall, and you have each character going down uh, you know one uh, you know uh, one column. And you're tracking each character and you're making sure that each episode you're having forward movement with all of the characters. And if they're not in the episode, you understand why they've stood down. There's a good reason, uh, you know, Robbie went to juvie. So we're not, you know, at first we're not with him for a period of time there, but you know, it's, it's always making sure that, you know, characters aren't standing still that these relationships that the characters have are, um, you know, uh, are complex and pushing each other's stories forward when you when you have them in scenes together. You don't have scenes and characters in scenes together for no reason. Like right. each each scene needs to be pushing story forward, not just the plot, but you know, usually there's something emotionally with the the key players in the scene that's pushing forward. Right. And so, have you guys had an idea of like, do you have everything done already, or do you kind of uh, as, you, as each season goes, you figure it out? It's, you know, there, there's, um, for our main characters uh, and a general arc that we have in our minds and where we think it's going to land and what the last episode and last scene would be and stuff like that. And, but that, that's all, you know, subject to change if, if a better idea comes along along the way. Um, it, it's really, I, I viewed it as like a tree that's been growing you know that's just like yeah okay you have the johnny daniel branches of this tree that we're following and then they become intertwined and there's yeah. another branch of like you know Cree silver and you're 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 following you know in different episodes you know which branch you're on and you know it you know in terms of like where it goes in a, on a micro level for like certain characters you know i think 
we have an idea of where we would like them to go in a macro sense, but it's always, you know, there's always blank spaces and there's always things that like each season you're going to and you're saying, are we sure about this? Or, well, what is the journey this season? If it's not, if they're not getting all the way to, to where they're going to end up, how, what's the interesting story that gets us to that, that point? And right. so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that we have not, you know, that, of figuring out, you know, that we have to do in terms of the journey. I think in general, we know where the end destination is. Yeah, season one, I would say like, Hayden, Josh, and I knew a lot of the details of that season before we got into the writer's room. And we sort of, at the beginning of the season, were sort of talking through, this is these are the big picture things that we're doing. Even, you know, we had written, I think, three of the scripts already before we entered that room. And we were able to kind of take people through it. Now, there were plenty of scenes within there and, and moments and jokes and things like that that we all came up with uh, in the room, but we had a lot figured out. As the seasons go on, it's hazier and hazier. Like we know what, what we're building towards, um, but you know, usually Hayden, Josh, and I will spend you know a little bit of time before the room, talking through some ideas, and then we download the room with the attitude of, this is what we're thinking in general, but let's figure it out together. And you know, when you look at you know seasons three, four, five, like most of the ideas that you're seeing, with the exception of like the big signposts, are things that our amazing writers' room comes up with together. I mean, I, I can't, uh, you know, uh, express strongly enough how wonderful our team is. We have uh, a lot of these writers have been there from the beginning and the people that we bring in and out have, have all contributed in great ways. And it's one of my favorite, some of my favorite times in life are spending time in a room, a room full of smart, passionate, hilarious Karate Kid fans who mm. want to tell this story together. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's so much fun. That's cool. That seems very fulfilling and makes the whole process that much more enjoyable. Um, so when you guys were teens, <clears throat> you probably created your own fan fictions with Karate Kid. Has anything, has any like original theory that you guys created back then uh, been incorporated into Cobra Kai now, or is it all kind of new? Uh, we, we didn't really get into the fan fiction aspect of Karate Kid. It was the, the, uh, the thing that John and I talked about with Karate Kid from the very beginning was Billy Zapka. Um, we were always obsessed with that character, Johnny and the Cobra Kais. Uh, I think John said this earlier and I, I did too. When we watched Karate Kid as kids, mm -hmm. it was all about Daniel mm -hmm. and living through that. By the time we became teenagers and we're looking at our, the movies we loved with the more, you know, uh, sarcastic, you know, teenage view, we started loving Johnny and, and just how, as John said, he's, you know, it's like the bully, but knows karate. And yeah. he happened to be in a bunch of other movies at the time where he was playing that, that character. So we talked about Billy Zapka a lot as teenagers. And so not saying that like the, the whole um, Daniel is the real bully and justice for Johnny and all that stuff, that, that wasn't really our MO um, as much as, being fascinated with that character and wanting to explore that character, wanting to have fun with that character. Um, he, he, in some of our early writings and comedy th that Johnny would be, you know, involved, uh, you know, at times there was a, an early draft of Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay where we had <laughs> uh, a, a Johnny kind of character that we ideally would be played by Billy Zapka. Um, and we actually wrote a letter to Billy Zapka at the time saying, hey, will you be in this uh, movie? And at the time, he was just like not wanting to do anything Cobra Kai related um, or rather Karate Kid related and, and wanting to break out of that role. So like we've been in that that world uh, of just loving Johnny. And so this this show has kind of fulfilled <laughs> our lifelong uh weird uh discussion about about that guy yeah i think the weirdest thing i would say is when when i was 18 and first went to college uh, i learned how to make web pages and i had a yeah. fan page dedicated to billy zapka as 80s asshole <laughs> that like i had one page like about the new york mets which was my favorite baseball team i had like yeah. 
another page about like my family and a one that yeah. dedicated to Billy Zafka. Cause we were always, there was just something that we loved about him and not only Karate Kid, but all those characters. Well, so, there was also the, the movie Just One of the Guys is a movie that was on HBO a lot around the time that John and I like first met. And so it was, it came out in 87, but it was just on throughout the 19, early nineties and stuff. And so in that movie, he's like just even more of like uh, just straight up bully. And he's got one of those like fingerless gloves that like a gym rat would oh, have. Yeah. And, and he's just going around like giving wedgies to, to people <laughs> in the hallway. And John had one of those fingerless gloves in high school. And so we yeah. used to just like pretend to be that, that, that archetypal high school bully, which yeah. like when you're a kid is horrific and the saddest thing and your heart goes out to like the kids that are dealing with it but when you're an adult you're like you know who is this little piece of shit kid like right. and what is he doing you know so yeah. we're in that phase of like early adulthood where we're able to laugh at it and i think that you know th those early days we weren't like fan fiction writing at the time but that that's what we were talking about at the time got it okay did you ever have any other ideas to you know, with season one being so johnny focused did you have other ideas that you wanted to maybe start with Daniel or start with Crease or uh, any other characters or was no, it always Johnny? It was always Johnny. I mean, we, we talked, the truth is this really started to crystallize when we were in our early twenties, Hayden and I lived together out in LA. Uh, cool. We had moved out, uh, you know, we sold a script when we were seniors in college and then moved to LA and then Josh, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, my, my good friend in, from Penn, he went, to San Francisco and then a year later moved to LA and lived a block from us. And every night we would like, we'd be writing all day. And then at night we'd watch movies together and just, you know, that the DVD came out, uh, like a, like a new special edition karate kid came out and we're watching all the special features and Zabka in those interviews was talking about how he didn't view himself as, as a bully or as a villain in the movie. He viewed himself as a regular high school kid. He's got a year to make it work. He has this ex who he loved this guy comes to town and, and gets involved and, and, you know, causes conflict with his girlfriend. And, you know, that was his approach. And I remember that interview being the thing that really crystallized stuff for us where we're like, you know, we've always talked about this character. We should do a movie called Cobra Kai where we pick up with Johnny in his adult life and see what happens to the bully from high school and, you know, humanize that situation because like what was going on in his life that made him act the way that he did and all that stuff. That's when we started to quest get deeper about like what was going on. So it was really Johnny from that point forward was sort of our entry point into whatever we were gonna do Karate Kid related. Cool. Um, so jumping to Karate Kid 3, uh, when Silver and Kreese bow and say party time, what do you think would have happened if they actually did fight together against Miyagi? <laughs> Do you think it would have been? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like uh, we're all friends, right? Like they, they yeah. do a one at a time approach didn't work. It's a very, it's it's a good, it's a good question. You know, I, I, you would just think that Miyagi would still be able to take of them course. on, but we wouldn't. You know, we haven't seen that, so we don't know for sure. Right. Um, so with Johnny fighting Silver, it seemed when he incorporated Miyagi Do and Eagle Fang, he was still quite outmatched. And then in season three, we saw a lot of hidden stuff with Miyagi-Do uh, that Chosen taught to Daniel. Are there hidden things with Cobra Kai that we might come to learn later on? Like uh, if we go further into the depths of Cobra Kai with, uh, you know, uh, some of the original masters like Kim Sun Young and um, any, anyone else? Or do we, you not we, answer that? We can't answer questions like that. But, uh, okay. you know, okay. needless to say, I, I will say that when we're in the writer's room, we always think about the origins. Where where do where does Cobra Kai come from? Where does Miyagi Do come from? Uh, what's the history before our our world? And you, you saw in season three, you get a little taste of of some of that. You know, with Captain Turner, yeah. who you know, introduced martial arts to to Crease and Silver. So you know, is it possible that we'll continue to explore that kind of stuff going forward? You never know. Maybe. Okay. Cool. I thought I'd ask. Um, with the flashbacks that we saw in season three of the war, I originally thought Ponytail was silver and we see that he wasn't. So does silver kind of mold his entire look forever to honor Ponytail or um, are we going to learn more about Ponytail? Because obviously, I mean, when we see silver, he's like very timid, very soft spoken. Something must have happened that he's 
who he is now. Is there anything that we're going to dive into? Um, it's certainly possible. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not you know, I'll, I'll just say, you know, if you see in season four, we, we dipped back into the, uh, the, the flashback of, uh, young priest and young silver. We love, you know, the actors, uh, you know, Barrett and Nick who portray those characters, the younger versions. And, you know, we're, like John said, we do think about a lot of the backstory and we think about these characters. We think about what's happened in the intervening years. Right. Um, and, you know, the question is, you know, we have 10 half hour episodes and, and what are we going to say? Um, but, you know, we're, you know, the, the past is a big um, aspect of the show mm -hmm. and our, how we handle the past and memories. And right. so, you know, it's, you know, as, as we move into the future, we always look into the past and anything is possible. If you're, if you want to know more about, you know, uh, how silver became silver, you know, uh, that, that's the type of thing that, you know, we could easily end up, uh, you know, covering, but you'll have to see. Do you guys have a favorite character besides Johnny? You mean in, in Cobra Kai or in the Karate Kid? In Cobra Kai and Karate Kid. I mean, it, it's we fall in love with like every character, like yeah. where we're, we whether it's ranging from you know Johnny and Daniel and Miguel and you know the the, the main characters, but we get obsessed with like the pawn shop guy, you know we get a <laughs> mile yeah. the pawn shop guy yeah, like yeah, yeah. the yeah. all valley board is like yeah. like I love those guys like I love like there's like you know each one is distinct has their own point of view. Um, so like when we were doing like, you know, episode six of season four and we start with the all Valley board and you get into the minutia of their world, like that's interesting to us. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're, you know, it, it all, it dates back to like, you know, watching the Simpsons as a kid yeah. and, you know, like falling in love with every little minor character. And when they pop up, it's exciting to see them. It's a similar kind of thing that we do in, in Cobra Kai that there's this world building and you know hey is lynn gonna show up the you know homeless lynn gonna show yeah. up this season maybe maybe not you know that's yeah that's one of those things so i i you know that's my answer i don't know if hayden's just gonna be like terry silver is my favorite <laughs> <laughs> no i yeah i mean it's it's so tough because like i would say you know sometimes online that like terry silver is my favorite character but that that's i mean that i love them all you I've know learned you guys like, troll terry troll online. Silver, What'd you say? I've learned you guys troll online a lot. A lot of the things you say, I can't take for face value anymore. Hey, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like to mess around sometimes, but I also like to also you know leave breadcrumbs that that do end up paying off. Yeah. So so yeah. you can't totally discount what I'm saying. No, I, no, no. <laughs> um, I think there was one thing that you told me once, John. It was like Terry Silver owns. L Larusso Auto or the land beneath Larusso Auto or something, and I was just I like took it for face value, and I'm like, oh no, I got to do that. No, no, we, we, you know yeah. what? I, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I'll just say this: that there's some you know deleted scenes um, from season four that you know people will ultimately get to see that may you know shed light on on uh, some of the characters that you know. It's it's like we, we're always we, we we come up with a lot of stuff and then at the end of the day you're trying to you know have a, a tight episode and so yeah. uh, there may be like you know you, you were just asking questions but you know before about like uh, about silver and his life and and you know interesting things about him and it may be the type of thing that we did answer but like trimmed out because there wasn't time and so I'll say like I, I do think the next DVD that comes out for season four probably next year is mm -hmm. is you know, going to have some stuff, uh, some stuff on that, that sheds light. Cool. That'd be sweet. And then if you guys ever make some spinoff, uh, shows, I'd love to see a young crease, young Sato, uh, young Miyagi, young silver. I think those would be fun. Yeah. Um, so to me, do you guys, wait, do you guys have a, well, you probably can't say, but I bet Netflix chooses the dates for the release. Cause you guys are already done season five. So, I mean, yeah, we don't we don't choose the release dates. That's really a yeah. Netflix thing. You know, I think we, we have this pattern where it's been like, you know, the new year, New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve ish. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. You know, that's uh, it gives us, you know, some some time in between because we have other we have stuff that we're doing for this and stuff and other things that we're doing. Yes. America Pie. 
<laughs> well, uh, American Pie, I think, I think it's there's uh, there's no, nothing active with American Pie. Let me let me squash that right now. I know that there's right. there out there that say American Pie Five. Yes. Uh, you know, the quick the, the 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 true answer with that was before American Reunion came out, there was a lot of excitement about potentially doing a fifth movie. And the movie was a monster hit worldwide in America. It was, this was R rated comedies were starting to like not perform at the levels that they had been before. Um, and American Reunion was one of those movies that it did well in America, but not super well. Um, and it just, uh, you know, Universal, it was, it was economically challenging to make that movie in a way where they felt like definitively let's make a fifth movie. So we went off, we did other things. You know, is it possible that that comes back around at some point? Maybe we love that cast. We love, yeah. I mean, every, it was, we had a blast making it. It was a similar exercise to making Cobra Kai where you're, it's like fan fiction with characters that were, you know, so connected to your yeah. youth. Um, yeah. But as of right now, there's nothing active, at least with that we're involved with. Yeah. When it comes oh, to okay. Well, okay. It, it, it really was an amazing thing. It's a very similar th exercise that we had with American Pie to Cobra Kai. Um, that this was something that had existed already that we um, loved and got involved with because we loved and we wrote and directed the movie and our philosophy on it was we're not here to like do our own American pie. We're not like thinking like, okay, this one is going to look like this and right. have a whole different style and you know and and we're going to put our stamp on it i mean we wanted to put our own personal experiences in into it but it was it was most important to us that it feel like it have the connective tissue of the first three movies so that if you don't look at the credits and see who wrote it or directed it, it would just feel like yeah this is the next chapter of these characters lives yeah. and if you watch the movie for whatever you think about it it, it really does feel like an American Pie movie. And I think that that was our goal with, with Cobra Kai too. 100%. It, for me, I was born in 1990. So American Pie 1 and 2 were like a huge staple in high school when, when I was entering high school. And uh, it was a 2004 or something, 2003. And those movies have stayed so consistent. And with American Reunion, you killed it. It was great. And I feel like that's the connection I was making was that you had so much kind of training with bringing back these, like you guys are really good at bringing back these legendary characters that have already been established for so long and you don't ruin them, which is <laughs> well, nice. I, I think we just love them. Like, that's it. Like we love those characters. Like yeah. we want, we like, they need to feel, they need to sell to us as themselves still. They need to like, everything needs to make sense. So, you know, we put a lot of thought into it. Like we don't want anything to feel inauthentic. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there like every project that we've ever made in our career, it, there's a lot of love behind it. Yeah, you can tell. Um, would you ever be interested in working in Star Wars? Sure. <laughs> That'd be yeah. cool. I mean, yeah. I saw the I saw the little references at the end there <laughs> in season there's four. There's no no que I mean, we're we're enormous Star Wars fans, along with Josh, and it's the type of thing that you know we've fantasized about for a long period of time. And you know, uh, there there happen to be other people that fantasize about it too, and and, and a lot of different <laughs> things that are getting made yeah. in the whole world. Um, okay. And look, we're we're always ready to. I mean take on something that we love, you know, and like Josh said, John said, you know, it's like, that's something that it's like, you find that thing that you love about and you just write about that and you know, yeah. it's going to work. Um, yeah. and, and the audience will like it. And yeah, listen, I mean, that, that crazy thing about that is they, they really are the, you know, right now going and doing so many different things. Um, it's not like a, like with Cobra Kai, you're, we're, we're sort of now create, you know, in charge of overseeing this universe. <laughs> um, and so over there, it's like, okay, you have a, a galaxy that you get, you know, maybe um, yeah. but that might conflict with other galaxies and, and, you know, um, you get 25,000 years of, of, uh, of timeline to choose from. So it's, you can pretty much go anywhere you want in Star Wars. 
Yeah, but it, it, it's, I, finding, it, it's finding that right thing at the right time that no one else is doing within that sandbox. But we're we're pretty busy in the in the Cobra Kai yeah. uh, universe and with some other things that we're doing. But you know, it's we've we've certainly talked about it, and it's something that you know we'd have interest in. Can you um, tell me what you tell the audience what you told me about the Back to the Future thing to kind of dispel that myth out there? Oh yeah, no. I, with when it comes to Back to the Future, you know, we've been asked in the past, you know, what are properties that you guys would love? I mean, you see behind me, I have uh, you know uh, something from Back to the Future Part Two. This, I mean, Hayden, myself, and Josh are obsessed with Back to the Future, like we are Karate Kid, and and um, you know, it's that's a world that you know. Uh, uh, we would love to do work in at the same time, some, you know, big giant, amazingly talented heroes of ours, you know, created that, um, and have, you know, e expressed a desire to not continue, uh, with more, uh, more of that story, at least for now. Uh, and we respect that. So if it was, if those guys ever said, Hey, you know, uh, you know, why don't we take a look back in there? What do these guys have to say about it? Then, you know, we're, we're all for it, but we, we, we respect kind of their, their point of view. Well, if you do ever touch that stuff, I know it's going to be pretty awesome, whether you continue it or revamp it or whatever. I got five minutes left with you guys, and I'm going to ask a couple last questions here. Um, so to me, Cobra Kai screams redemption and evolution and the passing of the torch very eloquently with, you know, without, you know, kind of, um, shutting out the main characters and you just to highlight the new ones you do it in this really nice way um we see crease in the beginning where we kind of like hate him and then we feel sorry for him and then we hate him again and then now he's in a completely different position where he's kind of like the lesser of two evils almost um where he seems like he could be redeemed and i feel like he was looking at johnny when silver was beating him up like there was a moment there where he could maybe turn against silver and now i feel like maybe he will is there any sort of redemption at all for silver or is he like totally the emperor he's just there's nothing that could i guess that's kind of a big spoiler question <laughs> moving on mm -hmm. um I, okay. I mean, you know the interesting thing about season four is not that he was redeemed but it was almost like you know you saw the emperor kind of like having given up and retired and been like, yeah. that was a mistake, <laughs> you know, like at the <laughs> beginning. So in some ways you already saw him, I don't want to say redeemed is, is not necessarily the word, yeah. but you know, Terry sure. is um, at the start of season four. We, the analogy that we always used, again, we think outside of the Karate Kid universe, you know, when, uh, like we think of audiences besides Karate Kid fans. Most people haven't seen Karate Kid 3. How do we relate? How, do, how does an audience relate to this character if they haven't seen it? Our thought was these are like two old bank robbers. And this was a guy who's retired. He's out of the game. He's got a new life. He's got a wife, not a wife, but like he's got yeah. you know a new life. And this old, you know, his old uh, accomplice comes back and is like, hey, one last score. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> and that that's that's their dynamic, you know, yeah. as, as we start that off. And you see, you know, where he ends up going. And I know there's a lot of people online that talk about like, oh, he goes, he becomes Karate Kid 3, Terry, at the end of the season. And I think there's elements of that that are clearly there. But also, he is still the guy who remembers what happened in Karate Kid 3. And so, you know, he is, while, you know, uh, having those same kind of, you know, visions of grandeur for Cobra Kai that he did in the Karate Kid 3 days, he's also this guy who remembers how they fuck things up. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's always that makes him, uh, that could make him more rational or more dangerous or both. I, I think... I was just going to say, I think our approach with every character on the show is you want to be able to see their point of view. Like, right. we don't think that any, uh, like, we don't think Terry Silver thinks that he's being evil by wanting to expand Cobra Kai. We think that he, that there was lessons that were valuable to him and that he saw valuable to others in life. And he thinks he's doing good by yeah. 
spreading the Cobra Kai gospel. So I think that like, you know, when it comes to like, is, is someone redeemable or not? Like, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. I think we think like all of the characters, you know, have good in them and have bad in them, but you may think something's good and they may think it's bad and vice versa. Right. Um, so no redemption necessary for Terry. He's just no. great. He's already him. awesome. He's already you're, great. You're, you're taking that Obi one line and everything's from a certain point of view. So, <laughs> yeah. um, last question for you guys. Uh, I have a lot more, but uh, okay. So I love how you incorporated blood sport into the season. Um, have you ever considered Van Dam or Bolo Young uh, coming in on the show, or I don't know, maybe it's like an old sensei or something, some unknown sensei somewhere? I think it'd be pretty badass. <laughs> I don't okay. know. I don't, All right. I, don't, I don't think so. It's, it's, we, ha I don't think we have. I don't think we have. I think that, okay. you know, we're, we're, it's like blood sports in our world. The Johnny loves it. And, there, there, uh, there's a delicate balance always between like, are the actors, you know, characters that are, you know, are these famous actors, people that exist in our world or not in our world. And I know in, in, we're saying that, you know, Johnny, has lived in a world where there is Van Dam and there is there, are, there is blood sport. So it would be weird. Scene. It would be dead. So it would be as himself um, if if it were to happen. So and anything can happen. Right. Um, you know, it's just it's got to you know make sense with the story. Like Andrew Garfield. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is time. Um, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you coming on my channel and talking with me. And I'm, I'm a really big fan of what you guys do, and I'll be rooting for you uh, always. Thanks for supporting the show. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been great uh, great chatting with you. Great chatting with you too. Thanks. All right.